The subject this evening is a uh, is pretty serious one. It's uh, serious because that's how God portrays it in Scripture. The, uh, the picture of society, uh, according to Latter-day prophecy, is, is fairly graphic, and it's, uh, it's fairly sobering. And there's a, a warning to those who are alive in the last generation to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. While on one hand, that is a very blessed situation to be in. Of all the generations that have lived, we live in the generation that ought to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ based on the political signs that are taking place in the world today. But on the other hand, it's also a very dangerous situation. Dangerous because, as we'll see, there are five specific prophecies in the New Testament that warn the last generation that we are in danger of losing our faith, we're in danger of losing our hope, and in danger of losing our love for God. And the reason we face this danger is because the Bible portrays the evil, the level of wickedness that exists in the last day as being at a level that the world has never seen. That's the picture that the Bible portrays, that there will be more evil and wickedness that exists in the world at the time of the return of Christ than there has ever been. And, and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that in, in these prophecies. It will be a godless world. There will be sinful pleasures and enticements and attractions, and they will take a toll on the believers and on the young people. Some, the Bible warns, will be lost in that last generation because of the dangers they face. The, uh, the first reference is in the book of Revelation. For 1260 years, the book of Revelation warned that there would be a beast system that would dominate the world, or at least the Western world. And its primary impact upon the believers would be one of persecution. And so for centuries, we read the words of Revelation 13 and the warning to the believers who lived under this beast system, as it's described in, in the book of Revelation, primarily the Catholic Church and the power it had over the, uh, over the saints. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So from about 610 A.D. to 1870 A.D., the principal warning to the saints is beware you may lose your head. That is not the warning to the last generation. Take a look in your Bibles in Revelation 16. Begin reading about verse 12, 13, 14, 15, where it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ returning to the earth. Now, how do we know from these four verses that it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the second coming. What is the phrase in those verses that tell us it's dealing with a latter-day context? And you have good news and bad news. The good news is I know none of your names. So the bad news is we will have to deal in sections. So someone from this section, please, where is the proof in Revelation 16, from verses 12 to 15, sorry, 16, that these verses are talking about the latter days and not this 1260-year period 
that we looked at earlier. And what verse is that in? Verse 15. So you see, these are important verses for us. Because these are verses that talk about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the warning to the last generation in these verses? What is it that they are in danger of losing and it isn't their head? Someone in this section. Their garments. Their garments of righteousness as they're described in, uh, in chapter 19 at verse 8. So here is our first prophecy, and the warning is to those living in the last generation, which would include everyone in this room, the danger we face, according to the book of Revelation, is that we will lose our garments, our garments of righteousness. And Jesus is not speaking to those outside the household. He says, I'm going to come as a thief, and some will be caught unprepared, and because they will be caught unprepared, they will not have their garment of righteousness. In chapter 19, verse 8, it's, it's the fine linen. It's the, uh, as Brother Thomas described it, it's the righteous actions or the righteous deeds. So there is the first warning in Scripture to those who are living in the last generation. Beware lest you lose your garments. And the exhortation from the Lord is that the world will influence our thinking. It will influence our behavior. Hold fast to your garments of righteousness. Hold fast to that commitment to do what is right because you're going to live in a world full of evil. Now, where did all this come from? Who has at least been through grade 10 at Heritage College? So I understand in grade 10 you cover the French Revolution. Is that correct? So raise your hand if you have studied the French Revolution in school. Uh, not many hands up. Come on. Raise your hand if you... All right. So just a quick history lesson. The people in France had become so discouraged and so distraught and so angry with the nobility and with the church, they threw them all out. And what was their primary method of getting rid of the people they didn't like? The guillotine. And in its place, they ushered in an entirely new government. And they brought in the, the third estate, I think it was called. And the people finally had a choice. And they had the, the power now to make their decisions. And they were sitting down and they were going to write a brand new government. It wasn't going to be based on the papacy. It wasn't going to be based on the nobility. It wasn't going to be based on the bishops. It was going to give power to the people. God described this time in history as three demonic frog-like spirits that would be unleashed upon the world. And when they sat down to write their new constitution, they redefined what the word liberty means. And in Article 4, back in 1789, they said liberty consists in being able to do anything that does not harm others. This is 1789, originally written in French. Thus, the exercise of the natural rights of every man has no bounds other than those that ensure to the other members of society the enjoyment of these rights. So long as what you're doing does not harm someone else, you have the liberty to pursue that behavior. So can you get drunk according to this definition? Yes, as long as you don't harm someone else. Can you commit adultery and fornication? Yes, so long as you don't harm someone else. Now, it has taken... 200 some years for the full fruits of this definition of liberty to be manifested in society today. But this is why we are seeing the society we live in, whether it's Australia or Canada or the United States or Western Europe, now marching under the banner of liberty as defined 
by the French National Assembly. And the Bible warned that these three frog-like spirits of liberty and equality and fraternity coming out of the second earthquake of the book of Revelation, it would send shock waves throughout the earth and it would redefine how man viewed his moral code. And that's in verse 13 when the frog-like spirits are unleashed. And it's in verse 15 that Jesus says, I'm coming as a thief and be careful that you don't lose your garments. Well, the book of Revelation is not the only place that warns us of the conditions that exist at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Mount Olivet Prophecy is given by the Lord just days before he is crucified. Matthew records what he spoke. Mark records what he spoke. And Luke records what he spoke. They're nearly identical, but not quite, because each of the three writers captured what they felt was the essence of the message of the Lord. And Jesus spoke in the Mount Olivet Prophecy of the conditions that would exist in AD 70. But more importantly for us, he spoke of the conditions that would exist at the time of his return, at the time of the second coming. And he says in the Matthew 24 account, But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. Is that speaking, let's see, we've had this section and this section. Now this is a great big section. So we're going to have to divide you up. So we're going to take the last five rows to begin with. In verse 48 of Matthew 24, is that talking about someone in the household of faith or someone outside the household of faith? And how do we know it's in the house? Delayeth his coming. Everybody see that? Jesus is not here speaking about someone in the world who has no interest or knowledge or care about the return of, his, of their Lord. He's talking about someone who is looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and then he delays his coming. And the mind and the outlook of that person is altered. And he says in his heart, and he calls him an evil servant. My Lord delayeth his coming. And what is the impact of the Lord delaying his coming? Verse 49, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Who would they be? Sorry? Yeah. His other brothers and sisters. His other CYC members. And he says, I don't want to pursue that way of life. Instead, I'm going to eat and drink with the drunken. Verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. And the Lord, when he returns, shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There should be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see the specific graphic warning of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the last generation... Some are going to say he's delaying his coming. I'm tired of waiting. I'm going to begin to live like the other people that I see around me. And he ends up mistreating his fellow servants in his pursuit of a life of pleasure. The Luke account. Beware lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Is it persecution that Jesus warns us about in the last generation in the Mount Olivet Prophecy? And the answer, no, it's not persecution. It's the same message that we saw in Revelation 16. The danger that the faithful will face in the last day is the temptation towards immorality, and the temptation towards being carried away by the, uh, the evil conditions that exist in that day. So that the challenge here is just like the challenge we saw in Revelation 16. Expect, the Lord said in the Mount Olivet Prophecy, expect those who are living in the last generation a moral challenge to your faith. Don't be caught unprepared. And that's why in the red boxes you see, beware, 
He doesn't say here, I'm coming as a thief, but he uses the synonymous terms. That day come upon you unawares. That day find you sleeping. When he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. But the Mount Olivet prophecy is not the only prophecy that speaks of this. For those of you that were out with us last night at Enfield, we briefly looked at this prophecy. If you open your Bibles to 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5, I think we're now down to the first five rows. How do we know? This prophecy, like Revelation 16, like the Mount Olivet prophecy, is written for those who are living in the last generation. These are what at back home we would call these lob ball questions. These are the easy ones. These are the ones that the grades three and four would find easy. But you see, I don't have the privilege of having a relationship with you yet. So we've got to go pretty easy in this first, first course. So how do we know? These are important verses for us because it's talking about our generation. Yeah, so put a mark by these verses, young people. These are specifically in the Bible for us. These verses don't apply to Abraham. They didn't apply to Peter and Paul. They didn't apply to the believers in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. They specifically are in Scripture for us. And it describes how these last days will be perilous. And the word means dangerous. And once again, these verses are not telling us we face danger because of persecution. They're telling us we face danger because of perversion. The perversion of immorality that dominates the latter-day society. So now we have Paul giving us the same warning as Christ in the Mount Olivet Prophecy, the same warning as John in Revelation 16. There's three things that people will love in the last days. They will love themselves in verse 2. They will love money in verse 2 because they will be covetous. And they will love what in verse 4? And that's the description of the latter day. Themselves, money, and pleasure. That is the picture that Paul is portraying and, uh, and painting for us. A preoccupation with self will be an overriding characteristic. Which is one of the reasons we see in social media use today. It is so, so easy to use that medium to broadcast yourself. I can tell you everything I did today and tomorrow and the next day if I choose to. And man has now invented the means where we can all tell each other about ourselves. And there is Paul warning us that in the last days people will be lovers of themselves. If I knew you better than I did, I would ask for the class of 2017 to please raise your hand. Not 2016, 2017. Just a few? A few more. See, we don't have right now in the brotherhood that I'm aware of, we don't have clear spiritual guidelines that govern how we should use social media. So some of us use some guidelines, others of us use other guidelines, some of us use no guidelines. If I lived here, I would challenge, encourage the class of 2017, sometime in the next 12 months, get together with yourselves and, and find a couple of teachers at Heritage, and you don't have to be at Heritage to participate, but our community needs, the young people in this room need guidelines for when we go on social media and we communicate with each other. Because if we have no spiritual guidelines, we will all do that which is right in our own eyes. And Paul warns us that social media that promotes self will have an adverse impact. So take a few minutes. Take whatever time is needed and get together with yourselves, with a, a, a brother or two at the school or an uncle in the meeting, and, and figure out what are the five or six or seven tests that a social media entry should meet to be a sound entry 
as a social media item. And, and, and talk amongst yourselves. And then hold yourselves accountable to those principles. Because that has not come out of our community yet. We're, we're, we're too far behind the curve, so to speak. Notice in verse 2, what will society teach children to do in the last days? And I guarantee there is no parent that wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I'm going to have to teach my child today how to disobey me. So the parents will not be teaching their children to disobey them in the last days. So where will the children be learning to be disobedient from their parents? They will learn it from the world because they're not going to learn it at home. Young people, don't let the world turn you against your parents. I know you're at an age that sometimes you see things differently than they do. And, and you live in a society that bombards you with all the reasons that you, knew, you know more than your parents. And, and your parents don't have a good understanding of the pressures and the issues you face. Don't listen to it. Paul warned us. That's what society would try to do in the last days is turn children against parents. So the moral challenge that Paul speaks of here is what we saw in Revelation. It's what we saw in the Mount Olivet Prophecy. Expect a moral challenge to your faith. We know in, the, in Luke 17 that the Lord Jesus Christ warned us that as it was in the days of Noah, it will be like that at the end times. And in the days of Noah, Genesis 6 says, the wickedness was great, the earth was corrupt. You take that word corrupt in the Hebrew and you look at it in Genesis 38, and it's equated with sexual immorality. So these descriptions are here. You just have to do a little research, a little digging. And Jesus says, the days of Noah in which men were corrupt and they loved violence, those days will exist at the time that I come back to the earth. So expect a moral challenge to your faith. And then a few verses later, we have the warning of Lot and all the perversion that existed in the days of Lot. And here is where we need to put the two pieces together. Jesus is saying that in the last days, right before he returns, God will take all, or God will will see unleashed on the earth, man will unite all the evil of Noah's day and all the evil of Lot's day, and they will converge into a single generation. The world has never seen all the evil of Lot's day and all the evil of Noah's day converge into a single generation. But that's the picture being portrayed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, the warning is, expect a moral challenge to your faith. Because in the days of Noah, the community got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until there were only eight who were, that were saved in the ark. Now, we're not suggesting that's what's going to happen here. But the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ is there will be pressure, there will be temptations, there will be pleasure, and it will take its toll. The last one is in 2 Peter 3. And it's very specific. Again, in verse 3, it says, In the last days there will be scoffers walking after their own lusts. Now we're going to ratchet it up a level. Is this talking about believers? Or is this talking about those outside the household of faith? So you're all going to have to vote in about 30 seconds. So take a look at the verses on the screen. Is Peter speaking of those within the household or those outside the household? So how many think he's talking about those inside the household? And you're right. The scoffers say what? Where is the promise of his coming? Those who don't know about the return of Jesus, those who are outside the household, would never say those words. 
You wouldn't call them scoffers because they're not even looking for Christ to return. But those inside the household become impatient, just like we saw in the Mount Olivet Prophecy. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. There are actually three things the believers in these verses stop believing in. I gave you the first one, that Christ is going to return. What's the second one? I think we're back over here. One of the other two things that these verses say that believers, some believers, will stop believing in just prior to the return of Christ. Creation. Everybody see that? In verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant. They don't want to know. They've dismissed it. That by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. What's the third aspect that they stop believing in the flood that's a fairy tale (laughs) you believe in the flood and Peter is very specific and that's why we are seeing in the last days from within the household some beginning to question the creation Peter warned us that these days were coming. Now, he didn't talk about Darwin in the 19th century. He didn't go into that level of detail. But the Bible is fairly specific on these areas. And once again, we have Christ, Paul, Peter, and John all conveying the exact same warning to the last generation. Expect your belief. Expect your faith to be challenged. You are going to live in extremely immoral times, unlike anything the world has ever seen. And some will lose their faith as a result. Now, it isn't all dire when it comes to Bible prophecy. Because the flip side of this is that while on the one hand, the Bible portrays this explosion of evil that exists at the time of the end, the Bible is also very, very, very specific in describing extremely unusual situations that will exist at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So unusual that there can't be any other answer than that the Lord Jesus Christ must be very, very close to returning. So we have a very specific prophecy in Scripture that the nation of Israel would not exist for 1,900 years. And then at the time of the end, it would come back into existence. Who would ever have thought a nation that stopped existing back in the first century would all of a sudden come back into existence just before the return of Christ. And who would ever expect the city of Jerusalem to be lost to the Jews back in the first century? And lo and behold, 1,900 years later, Jerusalem is once again back in the hands of the Jews. A very unusual Prophecy, a very unusual and extremely unusual circumstance. But we've seen that come to pass. The Bible says, look for those three spirits of liberty, equality, and fraternity to spread from France to the Western world and to inflict and infect Western society with a philosophy that will be ungodly and and lead to an explosion of immorality. Very unusual prophecy, very unusual circumstances. Expect to see those at the return of Christ. In Psalm 2, it says, Expect Christians to reject the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns to the earth. When the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers take counsel together, against who? Who are these Christian rulers taking counsel together? 
against the Lord Jesus Christ. A very, very unusual, extremely unusual circumstance that the Christian community would be in a position at the time of Christ's return of rejecting him. That wouldn't have been true 100 years ago because 100 years ago, the false teaching of the future Antichrist hadn't yet pervaded Christianity, but it's pervading it now. And Christians aren't even looking for Jesus to come back to the earth until the Antichrist has taken his seat in Jerusalem and made his covenant with the Jews and called for the temple to be rebuilt and, had, and sacrifices to be offered. So when they see those things begin to happen after Russia has been destroyed, they will unite, as Psalm 2 says they will, as Revelation 16 says they will, as Revelation 17 says they will, and they will go to make war against the Lamb and his saints. A very unusual set of circumstances that Christians would actually fight against Christ. European nations to unify. Nowhere in the history of Europe have the nations ever willingly given up their sovereign power to a single central government. Napoleon tried to conquer Europe. Bismarck and Germany tried to conquer Europe. Hitler tried to conquer Europe. But the Bible says in the time of the end, these European nations will willingly, willingly give up their power to a central government. That will become the beast which is ridden by the apostate woman that will lead them into battle against the Lord Jesus Christ. Homosexuality to become a celebrated lifestyle. Who would have ever thought that homosexuality would become a celebrated lifestyle? An extremely unusual circumstance but we're seeing it come to pass. Russia, Germany, and France to be aligned. Do you know in the history of Russia, Germany, and France, they have never, ever, ever been aligned. They each tried to conquer one another. Two of them would get together and try to conquer the third. One would try to conquer the other two, but they have never been aligned. In the year 2003, when the U.S. and Great Britain were invading the Middle East for the first time in the history of Europe, Russia, France, and Germany, Rosh, Magog, and Gomer, may have that order reversed, sorry, all stood together. Very unusual prophecy. Some Arab nations hostile to Israel in the past would all of a sudden become Israel's friends. We know from Ezekiel 38 that Sheba and Dedan will be allied to Israel. Believers to question the accuracy of the biblical account of creation. Who would ever expect that to come out of the community of believers? And lastly, in Daniel 12, it talks about a surge in travel and widespread increase in knowledge. And young people, you have seen the last six items on the chart take place in your lifetime. You have seen the explosion of the internet where in knowledge is now increasing. You have seen the European nations willingly cede their power. You have seen homosexuality become now a celebrated lifestyle. These are all things the Bible said would exist at the very end times and they've happened in your lifetime. That is how close the Lord Jesus Christ is to the return. God is appealing to us to take note because the time is coming when the Lord will be back in the earth. Now, we have put together a graph. For those of you who do not like mathematics, who are you get a nervous twitch when you see a graph go up on the screen, I apologize. We'll try to keep it simple. Your math teachers will be pleased if you can, if you can stay with the discussion. Remember the x-axis and the y-axis. It isn't going to get any more complicated than that. No calculus, no trigonometry. 
On the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, we have godliness. And the Bible says, as time goes on, expect to see a moral decline in society, as we've seen from Revelation 16, Matthew 24, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter 3. So the graph portrays, as simply as we can, that in 1996, there is a certain level of godliness. And as time goes on, and society's morals decline even further, the godliness ends up declining. So the Bible says, over time, look for the godliness in society to decline. That's the warning, if we were to put it on a graph. The Bible doesn't hold out any hope that in the last days, somehow that curve is going to all of a sudden slope up. That is the same graph that existed in the days of Noah. That is the same graph that existed in the days of Lot. And it's the same graph that we're seeing today. And God brought judgment in the days of Noah. God brought judgment in the days of Lot. And the Bible says God will bring judgment in the last generation. Now you can use the graph to identify why there has been a decline whether the issue is music, or the issue is movies, or the issue is drinking, or the issue is language, whatever it is, the challenge you have is that you have only been alive for just a few dots on the line. Talk to older members in your ecclesia. So for those of you that thought you were outside of the scope of tonight's discussion, raise your hand if you were alive back in 1986. Sorry, let's go with 96. 1996, okay, that's too many. Let's go back to 1986. How many of you were alive? There are a few up there. See the ones that are sitting way back up. And there's a few in the... Uh, and the ante room as well. Don't let them get away tonight without giving you an example. Whether it's music or movies or television programs, whatever it is, a clear-cut example where they can validate what this slippery slope is depicting. Now, I wouldn't encourage you to go into Google and ask for the lyrics of the number one rated song in 1986 and then compare that to the number one rated song in 2016 because I think the language would be too graphic and it would not be a healthy exercise. But I think you can imagine if you compared the lyrics of the music. I wouldn't encourage you to sit down and watch the most popularly rated television program today and compare it to what it was back in 1986. I wouldn't encourage you to go to the movies today and see the number one rated movie and then go watch the one that was from 1986. But you can see where this is going. Now, the danger for us, and, and I'll give you just, uh, just one example. The danger for us is that it's happening right before us. I believe this man's name is Mr. Dumbledore. I could be wrong. I haven't read the books. I don't recommend you read the books. But he was a very popular character in the Harry Potter series, which came out in 1997. In 2007, there was a meeting in Madison Square Gardens in the city of New York where the author was going to make an appearance and they filled the stadium. And she used that occasion to announce, yes, Mr. Dumbledore is a homosexual. And the audience erupted in applause. And she admitted she couldn't say that back in 1997 because her books wouldn't have sold. But in that 10-year period of time, society had flipped on that issue. 
just as the Lord Jesus Christ said it would. The challenge you face is that's all you've ever known. Talk to the older members in your ecclesia. They will tell you. They will validate the decline of the line. It is going in that direction. They will give you first-hand account of the language they hear now. You know, I can remember watching a television program from the 1950s. Now, I wasn't alive back then. At least I wasn't old enough to. But it was, and, and they would have a bedroom scene. And the man and the woman would be in separate beds because they wouldn't dare shoot a scene in a bedroom with two people in the same bed. But they do that today. Just one example of how society's morals are degrading. And the danger we face is we don't want to be caught up in it. You have probably seen the empirical and the objective studies they've done about video games. They can measure in our brains when we play video games. And they can identify the sections of our brains that are excited when we play violent video games. Not that we should. But they can now do this scientifically. And, and they can see the effect on the brain. And you have probably heard of the countless stories in the United States where young people are infected with this. And at the end, they pick up a gun and they go into a school and it's horrid. These things have an impact on our mind. They have an impact on our personality. It's not something that we should be participating in. There's a study in 2014 from the Iowa State University that validates, you know, if you're, watch, or if you're playing these video games, it says it's just like the piano. You can walk away from the piano 10 years, and you can come back to it, and you can still play pieces that you did 10 years ago because those memory patterns have been laid down, and it's the same impact. The danger of the slippery slope is I can fool myself. I call this the deceitful gap. If my standard is I can watch, but I would never do, I create this gap between where society actually is. You know, I'd never do what they do in the movies, but I'll watch what they do in the movies. And I'm deceiving myself because what I am watching here in 1986, that's me, well above the line, would never do it. I'd watch it, but I'd never do it. By the time I get down here to 2016, look what I'm now watching. Society's decline has become my decline. So this idea that I can watch but not participate is going to get me in trouble. We know Christ's gospel is clear. If I think the sin, if I watch the sin, I've done the sin. That's the standard of the Lord Jesus Christ. We won't spend time on the conscience because of the, uh, the lateness of the hour. But be careful with your conscience. God has given us a conscience to protect us from sin. That's why it's built in. To our mind. It's why we have it and the animals don't. Because there is a moral component to how we are to live. We're not born with a pre-programmed conscience. We program it based on what we feed it. Scriptures warn us that our conscience can become defiled. It, be it can become seared. And the Greek word there is it can be cauterized. It's like you take a hot iron and, and you put it on, and, and it's lost its feeling. We can become desensitized to sin. So that the very element that God has given us to protect us from sin, and the, the best analogy we can use is a, a, a picture of the Iron Dome. You know, the Israelis, out of a desire to protect themselves from all those rockets that are coming across from Hamas, have now built this wonderful defense mechanism where the rockets come over, the first thing the system does is gauge where that rocket's going to land. And if it's going to land in an open field, they let it fall and, and blow up. But if it's headed for a populated area, they will take it out. Very effective. Not 100% foolproof. So they're coming up with the, uh, the David's sling, I think, as the next generation. 
But you see, that's how God wants our conscience to work. So that as those missiles of temptation come at us, that we have a defensive mechanism to protect ourselves from those missiles. But if we turn our defensive mechanism off, we're in deep trouble. So don't let other people play with our conscience. Don't allow others to turn off our conscience. Don't expose ourselves to situations in which our conscience will become numbed and eventually defiled and finally seared to where our conscience is no longer effective. That's the warning of Scripture. The other danger that this graph portrays is the principle of extrapolation. Now that, I think, gets into trigonometry, but it's a little too long since I've been in it. But it's that principle where you take the data and then you extend it out a few more years. Where do I end up 10 years from now if Christ remains away? If my standard is, I will watch, but I won't do. And the answer is, there will be no limit (laughs) to what I will expose myself over time if I have hitched my entertainment to the world's entertainment. Because as that slope continues to go down, it's going to take me with it. So the danger we face is the need to separate ourselves and to maintain a separate standard altogether, which is why in Scripture the standard of holiness is the standard we need to maintain. God does not ask us to be sinless, but he does ask us to maintain a standard of holiness. And there's a difference. If he asked us to be sinless, we would fail and we would be lost. He doesn't ask us to be sinless. He asks us to maintain a standard of holiness so that when we cross that line, we will know we've crossed the line and we will come back on the right side of righteousness. It's critical that we retain holiness as our standard of conduct, which is why in Scripture it doesn't tell us to be sinless, but it does tell us to be holy. The other thing we should expect to see is that the gap between our standards and the world's involvement is going to to widen. If we were to put a line between here and here, do you see how that gap is going to increase over time? We don't know how much time we have left. But if the Lord Jesus Christ does not return in the very near future, we know what's going to happen to uh, to the line of society. So the principle we need to live by is found in Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love Yahweh hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. To encourage us to learn to hate the evil and love righteousness, God has promised us a kingdom. He says, if you will learn to hate the evil... And to love righteousness, I have a kingdom of righteousness that awaits you. There's wisdom behind making it a kingdom of righteousness because the kingdom of God is intended to be a powerful, motivating influence in our life. A motivating influence for good. It's intended to transform our character, to prevent us from doing what's wrong and to encourage us to doing what is right out of a desire to be part of that future kingdom. Now, I'm not looking to be sacrilegious here, but think it through. What if it was a kingdom of chocolate? Who would that, or what type of person would that kingdom attract? Lovers of chocolate. What if it was a kingdom of entertainment? What kind of people would that kingdom attract? 
What if it was a kingdom of sports and athletics? What kind of people would that kingdom attract? You see, God has purposely, purposely held out the kingdom as a kingdom of righteousness. Multiple verses in scripture, we won't go through them all. So that those who will be attracted to the kingdom are those who have learned to love righteousness, who have seen the evil that the world has to offer and they recognize that is not the way I want to live. Righteousness is a better way to live. It doesn't mean we are sinless. It doesn't mean that we are righteous. But it does mean that we are devoting ourselves in the path of righteousness because that is an important value in our life. That is something that we place in high esteem. So that Jerusalem is called the city of righteousness in Isaiah 1. And Yahweh, our righteousness, in Jeremiah 33. And in the kingdom we know the whole world will seek after righteousness. And they will go up to Jerusalem to be taught about righteousness. And what God is trying to do is appeal to us. Learn to love righteousness. See the value of it. In the kingdom, the saints' role will be to encourage mortals to embrace righteousness as a way of life. It really is a better way to live. Because if we are chasing that line of society that continues to degrade with each passing year, it, it, it's going to be a sad future for those who are, are, are putting their interests in what society offers. I know it's attractive. I know it's full of pleasure. I know it's enticing. There are places I can't go. There are things I can't watch. Because you don't outlive these things, they are always there. I know from my own experience, I have to avoid certain situations because I realize that if I put myself and expose myself to those things, righteousness is not going to be the result. I pray daily that God will deliver me from evil and save me from temptation because I know how vulnerable I am. And, and that's the spirit that God is looking to develop in each of us. It's dangerous, he says. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ warned that I'm coming back, and I'm coming back as a thief. Be on your guard, be watchful, be diligent. Maintain holiness as your standard of conduct. Because for those who do, there is a crown of righteousness that awaits us. And a kingdom of righteousness. And the privilege of being with our Lord throughout eternity.